Jesus to stand beneath us. Oh, what a beautiful night. Oh, what a beautiful night, my friends. Oh, what a beautiful night, depending on what part of the planet you're living on and if you're not in northeastern Japan, I suppose. Well, tonight we've been talking about Fukushima Update and FukushimaUpdate.com, and we're now going to transition over to talking about the Food World Order with our friend James Evan Pilato of FoodWorldOrder.com. And in order to do that, we're going to uh, transition with a, uh, a very apropos story that I posted up yesterday to Fukushima Update. Uh, Fukushima Ambassadors to Eat and Support East Japan this coming from the excellent XSKF, again, another uh, site that I will definitely recommend for people who haven't been checking it out. He does a lot of great uh, translations of a lot of stuff that's that's only available in Japanese. He makes it available in English, so a very valuable resource there. And this story, uh, just uh, one of those ones that just make you shake your head. Quote, the Japanese government is going to make those these young women eat food from the nuclear disaster affected Tohoku and Kanto to support the recovery. This is simply beyond my comprehension. Some on Twitter call it student mobilization, just like during the World War II. The government knowingly putting young people in danger so they can remain in their positions a while longer. And then it quotes uh, from this, uh, this document announcing this uh, Japanese government uh, program. It says, Miss Campus to become ambassadors to support the disaster recovery, says Ministry of Agriculture, F Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. To support the agriculture, forestry, sand fisheries industries in the and <laughs> that should be and fisheries industries in the disaster affected areas, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries appointed nine Miss Campus beauty queens on nine campuses, including Aoyama Gakuin University and Gakushuin University, as eat and support student ambassadors on February 15th. The nine young women will participate in activities not only for the disaster recovery, but also for improve, improving the food self-sufficiency rate. Oh, well, that sounds good. We're all for food self-sufficiency here, so that should be a great thing. Well, James of FoodWorldOrder.com, what do you make of this story? Well, I, I first want to say, you know, thank, thanks again for having me. And I would say, you know, Fukushima Update and e, &E News and XSKF probably make the kind of holy trinity, I think, of, you know, Fukushima-related stories and those those are really the go-to sites this one i've never been compared to the christ before but um but thank you for that to, to what <laughs> to the christ oh, okay. sorry <laughs> <laughs> but this one is you know it's a really it's it's a disturbing one just on its face because as it said and there's the photo to go along with it so folks of course need to go see the story where it said you know the japanese government is going to make these young girls you know eat eat food and again it's all about a you know propaganda public relations kind of push that's exactly right and as i have always said i mean i think the food supply is the main concern for people here so if they can get people to uh, to go along and and mindlessly eat it all up uh, in as a way of supporting eastern japan what what's that's just the ultimate propaganda and the ultimate uh, death sentence for some people and I, I again i don't say that lightly there was a story earlier this year about or actually it would have been late last year about a tv newscaster who had been eating um, fukushima area foods uh, as a way of supporting eastern japan who came down with a, a rare form of thyroid cancer and died last year so again uh, again it's one of those things you can't prove it you can't you can't definitively say yep it came from eating that food mm -hmm. but uh, but you know if the, if the shoe fits well and that almost reminds me in a way of some of the more recent reporting on on 9-11 ground zero you know the scientists saying you know it's going to reach the point where we're not going to be able to say you know so and so got his cancer from smoking and so and so got his cancer from ground zero where again you know this, the air was safe to breathe huh ah huh, yes trust your government they'll never lie to you <laughs> all right well well let's switch over to foodworldorder.com and what have you got for us on the menu tonight well and it seems so light in a way and, and not important. But I also actually want to say, and I, I mentioned this to you just briefly in, in the break there, that it was great to hear Brock from Queensland, Australia. And he has been, you know, a great, a great supporter of media monarchy, news tips and, and all kinds of other things. So yeah, that was great to, as soon as you said, we've got Brock from Australia, I was like, oh, sweet. Yeah. So yeah, th that, I love that. And, and to be able to come on here and to hear those folks and to be able to take those calls, you know, is, a, is an extra great step. So on the on the lighter note, James, we'll we'll start out with the easier stuff and get into the down and dirty and the in the binge and purge in a little while. But from yet again, Reuters, 
Kellogg's to buy Pringles from Procter & Gamble for $2.7 billion. Kellogg Company agreed to buy Pringles potato chips from Procter & Gamble for $2.7 billion in a cash deal that will nearly triple the cereal maker's international snack business. The transaction will also let household goods maker P&G, Procter & Gamble, finally leave the food business after its agreement with Diamond Foods Incorporated fell apart. Shares of Kellogg, which is aiming to expand a snack portfolio, I love international snack business and snack portfolios, that, that already includes Keebler cookies, Cheez-It crackers, and Kashi snack bars. Kashi being one of the numerous items that you know, you'll find in grocery stores that, again, is a little better than your average conventional kind of product. But, you know, once you kind of peel back the label, you'll see, oh, that's owned by Kellogg's or, oh, that's owned by Kraft or Nestle. But I digress. Their their stock initially went up on this news and then I think immediately was turned around as as I think Moody's and S&P all said, oh, actually, this might be a bad move. But adding Pringles chips to the mix will increase the size of their snack business to where it will amount. For as much of total revenue as its well-known cereal business, the world's largest, with brands like Special K and Rice Krispies. Procter & Gamble had agreed to sell Pringles to Diamond Foods Incorporated last year, but that deal fell apart this month following discovery of improper accounting that led Diamond to replace its chief executive and finance chief, and the U.S. government is looking into Diamond's accounting practices currently. Diamond said on Wednesday, that would be the 15th here in the States yesterday, that it doesn't have to pay any breakup fee and its shares rose nearly 5%. And with Diamond's future unknown, some analysts have begun to question the attractiveness of its snack food brands, Kettle, Potato Chips, and Pop Secret Popcorn to another buyer. Now, James, the Kettle part is interesting to me because they were recently at, they were owned by a UK firm called Lion Capital, which again shows you a lot of times our food companies aren't owned by people who care and love and are passionate about food just as you know the people who run record companies don't necessarily love and are passionate about music it's just another widget to sell and to diversify their portfolio but kettle chips are actually still based out of salem oregon and i've got a bag sitting next to me and i'll admit they're kind of a you know an, an indulgence an indulgence indeed. Well, um, well, I I shudder at the thought of sounding like CNBC here or something. But uh, but really, who's the winner in this deal? I don't know if anyone is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Just the uh, shifting of uh, of another corporate uh, beast around on the mm -hmm. uh, on the old chessboard. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there you go, Pringles. Well, it is interesting. I, I add a little graphic from from a UK source. And and again, I'll tell folks in, in all my postings on, on all my sites, I always try and add in all those extra bits and links. So if it says, you know, a report was released, I'll go and try and find that report and link up the PDF for you and add in other... And, and let me just attest to that because uh, it, it's definitely useful for the type of things that I do where I'm trying to collect, you know, the source documents and things. So yeah. I do appreciate that. And you, I didn't even notice that graphic was British until you mentioned it. And now I see, oh yeah, 955 million pounds. Well, and and it also totally says pretty. that <laughs> in the rise and rise of Pringles, they were created to answer customer complaints that crisps too easily cracked or went uh, right. stale. So another <laughs> oh, crisps triumph. Have, no, crisps are 955 million pounds. <laughs> but it's all right. I, my, my parents were British. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Parents, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so say. let's we can flip entirely and, and get a lot simpler with a story that originally comes from WSBT.com. And again, I like to try and find a lot of stories that, you know, may be specific to a place whereas you know this this story that we're about to talk about is specifically out of and sourced from indiana but i think doing those kind of stories gives people the kind of microcosm and they'll look at it and go hey i think that's happening in my town or or oh geez i wonder if that's happening in my town but indiana's amish food markets seeing growth and and i'll just briefly read even though schmuckers not to be confused with smuckers and the aforementioned mega corporations even though Schmucker's Produce Farm and Greenhouse has been in business since 1964, it doesn't have a sign on the property, something not uncommon among Amish-owned businesses. Many do little or no advertising, and a few don't even have phones. 
But lately, more people have been finding their way to Amish food sellers, sometimes driving long distances to shop, says Gary Zare, president of the Merchants Association in Shipshawana, Indiana, a regional mecca for those seeking Amish-style food. Lately, more are straying from the tourist-beaten path to discover food purveyors, even using the bulk and specialty markets, bakeries, and and meat-and-cheese shops for periodic grocery shopping. James, I see this as an amazingly positive move, that people going somewhere, people who just are passionate about the food, and you don't even have to tie on any kind of, you know, religious or, you know, moral overlay to it. They just, yeah, well, I I haven't clicked through to the uh, the source article. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but uh, but does it go on in any way to interrogate why this is happening? I'm not sure if it does off the top of my head. Um, I think they just kind of talk to some of the different businesses and da, 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 da. Oh, I see yeah. no, everything looks so good and prices are wonderful and uh, no no preservatives says Howard Yoder who scoots around the small country lane bakery he owns yeah so I mean, they do start to touch on some of it but I mean clearly why are people flocking to to Amish owned businesses uh, to to buy their food well clearly because uh, they they want food that's actually food not the genetic monstrosities that mm-hmm. were Unfortunately, more and more uh, are being shoved down our throats. So, uh, so yes, it is a positive sign, and it does once again go to show that there are alternatives, and that it, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes we have to go out of our way, and we have to do things that are that are more costly or more difficult. But, uh, but if they can be done, and if we can direct our dollars away from the mega corporations and towards, you know, little uh, operations that that are actually we know where the food is coming from, then how could it not be a positive thing? And and I believe we've seen Amish communities be kind of on the front lines. I think of also the raw milk crackdown. Am, uh, that am I right? As yeah, as far as I know, that absolutely that that's something that's uh, that's a huge huge issue. And I I notice you have a raw milk post. Oh, I do see, and that's and you know again, James, things kind of move so so quickly that. And I have to go. Oh, that's right. I do, and it's still probably on the on the front page of Food World Order. Yeah, whether you like raw milk or not, it has been part of mankind's diet for thousands of years, which is why I find it suspicious when the government insists that you can only drink a particular form of milk in which the nutrients have been destroyed. Yeah, well, uh, again, people can take a look at that. Questions about raw milk? Ask a farmer right there on the front page of foodworldorder.com. Um, because absolutely, I mean, raw milk, uh, just another one of those things that the government presumes to have the authority to be able to tell you that you can't put in your own body. Well, in that, in that story from, from BrassCheckTV.com, sources and, and cites a story from the Globe and Mail about the Queen of England and the royal family. They're all raw milk drinkers. So, you know, again, it shows another way that when you look at the elites, they know what's up. Yes, yes. Don't do what they do. (laughs) <laughs> we we should be content with whatever they 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 let us have like Pringles whatever scraps we're allowed to have them on <laughs> ridiculous like Pringles well, I right? think we should get to a binge and purge we're I running think out of time. We, I think we should and this is actually where some of the more you know heavier and probably more important stories go and again I'll just quickly tell folks the binge and purge is something I post up on on Thursdays and it's just a list of headlines that just didn't for whatever reason get their own post on the page. But it begins with a story that I cite from medicalnewstoday.com. Organic food can have high concentrations of arsenic. And it cites a paper called Arsenic, Organic Foods, and Brown Rice Syrup, showing that so much of this is coming from the arsenic in brown rice and then only compounding and become more concentrated when it's turned into syrup. So that goes into, you know, the aforementioned cereal bars and and sports bars and even baby food at concentrations as much as six times above the EPA safe level for drinking water, James. Well, it does go to show that uh, that absolutely just because something's organic or has that label does not necessarily mean it's safe. And we still have to be careful about what we're putting in our bodies and we still have to be knowledgeable about it. I mean, we can't just rely on on these types of labels as sort of the solve mm-hmm. solve all our problems kind of thing for, for food safety. So I link to the abstract of where this is published in Environmental Health Perspectives. They have not posted the full article yet, but that, again, when they do, that'll point right to the, the PDF. 
EU and Europe reach organic trade deal, James. This one from SummitCountyVoice.com. In a huge move for organic producers and consumers, the U.S. and European Union said this week that organic products certified in Europe or in the United States may be sold as organic in either region. The formal agreement, again with the link to the PDF for you, was signed February 15th in Nuremberg, Germany. The partnership was touted as establishing a strong foundation from which to promote organic agriculture and benefiting the growing organic industry to support jobs and businesses on a global scale. Is this a good story? I mean, is this positive? I don't see it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I fail to see why this is a good thing. Nope. I mean, it's good in terms of cross uh, cross Atlantic trade, I suppose. But again, is that really going to be benefiting the small organic farmers or the big, you know, industrial mm -hmm. operations and the big agri type things? I mean, clearly, this isn't about the little guy. And it's uh, just part of that race to the bottom that's inherent in all of the bureaucratic decisions about uh, food safety standards mm -hmm. and things. I mean, obviously, there are different standards for what qualifies for organic in U.S. and EU, so I'm assuming they're just going to be dumbing it down to the lowest level. Maybe this next one will, will answer the question from the Atlantic.com. Organic farmer Prince Charles on changing our faulty food system. He's got a new 46-page book called On the Future of Food. That's basically a speech he gave in D.C. a few months ago. So again, we return to the quote-unquote royal family. Who have their uh, little uh, organic farmers and their butlers uh, follow them around the world when they go to give speeches in places like Washington, D.C. So there you go. I, mm -hmm. I guess he knows what he's talking about. And to his credit, I mean, Prince Charles was uh, was saying things about uh, about the GM genocide in India that I mentioned in my recent uh, GRTV backgrounder talking about uh, patenting life. And uh, and mm. he was one of the few people who were standing up and, and saying anything about that. And, and the farmers in India who have been killing themselves because they were uh, sold a bunch of uh, magic seeds that they were told would end all of their problems. But of course, uh, that didn't exactly happen. And they all ended up going into huge amounts of debt because the uh, the seeds, the GM seeds come with that Terminator technology, meaning that they can't even save the seeds and plant them again the next year so. So again, I mean, there are some good things that come out of it, and I guess Prince Charles worries his awareness of things like that, which is good. But obviously, I mean, clearly, it's a it's a question of uh, do as I as I say, not as I do, because uh, clearly he doesn't want the vast majority of people to to have access to the fresh foods that he does. But at any rate, we'll take a short break, and we will come to wrap things up right after this break. Welcome back to the final minutes of Corbett Report Radio. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And tonight is Thursday night, so once again, we're being joined on the line by James Evan Pilato of FoodWorldOrder.com, and we're going through his roundup of stories from around the world the, from the past week, the binge and purge that was posted up earlier today. And we've gone through some of them, but let's uh, let's wrap things up here with the last few stories, James. So uh, let's let's head on to the next story. All right, sir. Chinese leader gets a taste of the heartland. China's leader in waiting, Xi Jinping, gathered with U.S. agricultural officials in America's Green Belt today and stressed their shared interest in fostering increased trade in farm goods. So he's hanging out with Monsanto creature Vilsack, who's of course the head of. The Ag department here in the States. I found it really interesting, this one little quote, James. This is away from the sound and the fury of the cities, and the air here is very fresh, said she, whose first visit to the United States was an Iowa farm study tour and homestay in 1985. So she's bringing it full circle. Here is definitely a positive one, and, and I found this on blogs originally and, and realized it sourced back to Reuters, so I wanted to make the link to that main page so folks would see that this is the reality. Monsanto guilty of chemical poisoning in France. A French court on Monday declared U.S. biotech giant Monsanto guilty of chemical poisoning of a French farmer, a judgment that could lend weight to other health claims against pesticides. Cuba reports food output up 8.7% in 2011. Again, returning to the EU, food safety agency in the EU face faces fresh criticism. That's from gmwatch.org. Obama's budget cuts bacteria testing in produce, and that comes from the Associated Press. The budget plan sent to Congress this past Monday would axe the agricultural department's 
tiny microbiological data program which extensively screens high-risk fresh produce. Jimmy John's Sprout Break, fourth outbreak in four years. It's a fast food chain here that has constant outbreaks. And from the No Surprise Department from the Etocracy blog, man suffers heart attack while eating triple bypass burger at Heart Attack Grill. (laughs) And James, in closing, an obituary from the New York Times, Nello Ferrara, creator of Lemonheads Candy, dies at the age of 93, and he invented a lot of other candies. And again, another interesting bit. One of the candies is called the Atomic Fireball, and it was invented after Nello Ferrara served in Japan after World War II. A veritable Willy Wonka. Who knew? Um, Interesting. Well, that Monsanto story is hardening because, once again, it goes to show that when people stand up against the corporations, they can have an effect. And once again, uh, we find that uh, the the big corporations are vulnerable when people actually take them to to court and do things uh, to to try to stop them from their their reign. And it can have an effect and people can win and it can take years and it can be extremely painful for people in a lot of different ways. But eventually they can win exactly like Percy Schmeiser, that uh, that famous uh, Canadian uh, canola farmer who uh, who was the one that's that was the the center of that that story about uh, his crops got infected with the GM uh, foods and 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 uh, he he actually got sued by Monsanto mm-hmm. for infringing on their patent well you know I mean, it's a story that that a lot of people know but a lot of people don't know that he actually eventually won and he won compensation from Monsanto at least the uh, damages to clean up his field uh, so so again people can stand up they can win and India is currently uh, threatening to bring uh, charges against Monsanto for biopiracy which I go over in my latest GRTV backgrounder so so again Monsanto is not invulnerable these corporations that presume to own the world do not really and uh, we can have an effect so once again, James, thank you again for all of this uh, news and information. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you out there for listening and for phoning in and for all of the things that you guys do on your end. I couldn't do it without you. So until that, uh, until tomorrow night, once again, thank you for listening and take care.